Okay, can you guys see the screen? Yes. All right. So first of all, thanks to Praveen for uh, pointing this book out to us. It turned out to be quite an interesting one. Um, although after I uh, went through trying to prepare a summary of it, I realized that she kind of rambled on a bit. So hopefully this is a, a slightly more streamlined version of uh, what's in the book. So it's a book of, called Science of Canon Kant, the Physicist's Journey Through Land of, Can Land of Counterfactuals. And you may recall that Praveen had raised this whole issue of counterfactuals, I think back in uh, Santander, we were starting to talk about this idea. Um, and that's what the book looks like. You can get it on Amazon, it's not too expensive. And this is what the person looks like, so very young. And you could go on YouTube and watch a bunch of YouTube videos about various discussions in uh, where she's uh, involved. So uh, start with some very basic core concepts. Um, so uh, so this ties right into Praveen's uh, interest, which is complex complexity and complex structures. So we experience complex structures in the universe and they seem to persist. And what uh, Chiara points out is that the laws of physics are not especially designed to maintain complex structures. The laws of physics themselves are only designed to maintain very simple elementary particles. That's, her, that's one of the core basic points here. So if a complex structure is going to sustain itself to be resilient, uh, it has to be able to repair itself. And this requires the existence of something she then defines as knowledge, as we'll see. Uh, she defines knowledge as resilient information. Um, all these concepts we'll come back to, which requires something called an abstract catalyst. And these catalysts can be created either by a, a non-purposeful process of natural selection or by purposeful process of thinking. This might all sound very abstract right now, but we'll come back to it. She defines information as a physical property and defines certain kinds of things that carry information as information media. And they depend on this possibility of transformations. So one of the key things uh, about counterfactuals is that counterfactuals are directly associated, or physics is directly associated with this issue of the ability to perform transformations on things. Uh, talks about energy as an abstract physical property of something called work media. So information is an abstract property of information media, energy a property of work media, and she makes a connection between energy and information. Um, points out that work media are in fact a kind of information media, and then this develops a unifying link between information theory and thermodynamics. Okay, so those are some of the core things we'll come back to in a little bit more detail. She also points out that physics is stagnating or claims that physics is stagnating because there's an unspoken sort of stipulation agreement amongst people that for something to be really well explained, it has to be formed in terms of the laws of motion and initial conditions like Newton's laws and so um, She claims that this leads to the deep misconception that once you've specified everything that exists in the universe, and how it evolves, what happens to it. Then, in, then she claims that people think that, well, that means you've explained everything that can be explained. And she points out that that's not true. Uh, then she says, this narrows the scope of physics. It ignores other kinds of explanations, which are essential and creates barriers against people adopting counterfactual explanations. We'll get into that. Claims that a counterfactual based approach to science will dramatically uh, overhaul our way of looking at the world. So what is a counterfactual? A counterfactual is a fact, a statement about what could or could not be, what could happen or could not happen, as opposed to what is. So when we look at observations and data, we're talking about what is, and we're trying to determine what underlies this data, and that's about what is where she's saying that to understand the universe, you have to think not, in, not just in terms of what is, but in terms of what could and could not be. Um, and then points out that 
this uh, notion of counterfactuals is essential to be able to understand things that we currently don't understand necessarily very well, information, heat, work, flow, work, uh, knowledge creation, and so on. The counterfactuals that matter to science are about what could or could not be made to happen to physical systems. So what's possible or impossible. And they're fundamental because they express essential features of laws of physics. Um, and as an example, um, the possibility that you can take energy and transform it from one sort to another to perform a useful task would be an example of a counterfactual. The fact that you can do it is the normal thing. Yes, I can do this, I do this, and I do this. But the possibility of doing it or not doing it is what she refers to as counterfactuals. And as, an, as a simple example, if you um, run a computer and you have a set of operations and you have uh, an answer, you can't explain the answer, what the computer is doing, or what the computer is, by just specifying that it does this computation and this computation, this computation. You need to explain what the possible computations you could do with a computer and if it were programmed in many different ways. So expanding it from what you actually see happening to what you could make it do. Okay. And then she talks about two fundamental kinds of counterfactuals, the possibility and the impossibility of performing a transformation. So basically in order to go from anything to something else, you have to do a transformation and it's the possibility of doing that that she's interested in. And then she points out that these transformations that you can and cannot do are limited by the laws of physics okay, in our universe. So we can't bring about transformations that are not allowed by the laws of physics. Okay, so that's like a little primer. And then there's got, she's got seven chapters and I got a little summary of each of the chapters. Chapter one, she gives them different names, but to me, chapter one is about system res resilience. What is it that makes it possible for complex structures to arise? So the universe is made up of elementary constituents, electrons, quarks, etc. And due to the laws of physics, most of the things that arise are impermanent. So when they go to a, um, uh, what do you call it? A, a superconduct, uh, sorry, the collider, uh, where they do these things where they're trying to discover elementary particles, they, they do an operation, but it appears and it disappears. It's, it's very, very tenuous. But there are some fundamental art particles which happen to uh, remain continuously in the world. And she says the laws of the physics are basically designed in such a way, or they have the property of sustaining these particles. Uh, on the other hand, if you combine those particles together to form aggregates of complex structures, the laws of physics are not specially designed to preserve these aggregates. And that's uh, because they're only suited to preserving elementary ones. But the moment you put things together, they, they're constantly interacting due to forces with the environment. These interactions cause small structural changes and they introduce errors and then the structure decomposes and goes back down. So we think of this as you know, something like entropy or something in the universe. Um, but the basic point is once they revert to fundamental particles, they remain fundamental particles. They're not necessarily further destroyed. So you can build up something and then it goes back down to fundamental particles, build it up again. So, so without some kind of intervention to prevent that structure from falling apart, which means to correct those errors, the structure will fade away. And the more complex the structure, the harder it is to counteract those errors, the more work you have to do. So she points out that something, so she uses the term resilience, the resilience of a system, the ability to remain complex is a rare and noteworthy property of the universe. Um, and she defines resilience as the capacity of a system to maintain itself in, in existence. So self-preservation or self-maintenance. And as an example, living things have the tremendous resilience. In particular, they have the ability to repair themselves. And that, that information, which gives it the ability to repair itself is embodied in the DNA in something she calls a recipe. And that recipe codes how to generate a living thing out of elementary constituents. 
And that recipe has remained almost unchanged over billions of years, although it has evolved to be able to create more and more complex organisms. Um, she also points out that living things can also themselves manipulate their environment to help preserve themselves. So you've got the, the uh, resilience at the level of the DNA, and then you've got the resilience at the level of the organism. So in order to have this kind of resilience to maintain complexity, complex structures, you need a recipe. A recipe is basically an algorithm or a series of uh, operations, a series of transformations. So I used the other word procedures or algorithms. So this starts to connect into a sort of an algorithmic view of the world and points out that because of the laws of physics, these recipes must take the form of sequences or combinations of steps. And then the question is, how do these arise out of elementary constituents, which themselves know nothing about how to create complexity? And as an example gives Darwinian evolution, which explains how the recipes coded into DNA come about without somebody actually designing them or making them happen. In other words, a natural consequence of the laws of physics and the interactions of particles in the environment through this process of natural selection, which he points out doesn't have a direct purpose per se. So she calls it an undirected mechanism that produces purposeful complexity starting from the laws of physics and the elementary particles. And these recipes, these uh, uh, this information, this, these recipes that are preserved, which allow you to do this, constitute a kind of information. The key concepts in Darwinian evolution are replication, being able to make copies, error correction, being able to correct things that have um, um, changed, uh, being able to do variations, so you can do variations of the recipes, and then the process of natural selection which basically is a simple thing of what survives in the environment. And so by replication, you can take a pattern in DNA and you can, which is encoded in DNA and you can copy it from one generation to another, you can pass it on, okay? Similar to, you could take a book, you could write something in it and somebody else could copy it to another book and to another book and so on. So, uh, and then you have to do error correction. So the book, analogy is great because when the monks were copying the old texts, they had to have a process in place whereby when they copied it from one book to the next, you had to make sure that errors did not creep into the, to the copies. And uh, then you get interaction to the environment, you get these little errors that causes variations. Um, these can um, bring about novel variations of the coding and then natural selection decides which of these variations uh, persist because they cope better with the environment and which ones don't. So she defines a resilient recipe as something that sustains and propagates information. Uh, it's called resilient information because it's capable of self-preservation. And uh, so she defines that as knowledge. So she goes from defining recipes and resilience to inf uh, we'll get to information in a minute, but resilient recipes, and then she calls that knowledge. So knowledge is a recipe which knows how to uh, operate on the environment to sustain itself. That's her definition of knowledge. So uh, resilient info keeps itself instantiated by in physical systems. In other words, it maintains itself by encoding certain facts about the environment and the interactions of particles with the environment. And by keeping that uh, information about what's successful, uh, it, uh, that what's successful is what distinguishes between helpful and non-helpful changes. Okay. And then she points out that this definition of knowledge, because it's directly related to physical things that happen and to algorithms that, that are sustained by uh, particles of matter, it becomes a topic of physics. So you can even study knowledge, the evolution of knowledge, okay? Because it's directly, in, uh, directly a um, consequence of this uh, arising of complexity and maintaining complexity. And then she defines knowledge as the most resilient stuff in the universe. Okay, so if knowledge is a resilient, 
a recipe that knows how to sustain itself. How can it be created? Two ways, she points out. One is accidentally through Darwinian selection or non-purposeful non selection. And the second is purposefully through thinking. So um, there's a difference between accidental uh, variations and purposeful variations that human beings or animals do. So that knowledge of thinking is embodied in physical supports like our brains, bits of paper, books, the internet, et cetera. Et cetera. And then she does a connection to uh, Popper, who basically pointed out that knowledge creation starts with a problem, proceeds by, which is the contradiction to be resolved, which is like the environment you have to survive in, uh, proceeds by imagining some tentative solutions. That's sort of like a random variation where you test, where you say, well, it could be, what if I vary this or I vary this or I vary that? And then it's followed by testing and error correction to improve the solutions. The analogy when you're doing thinking is criticism. So you, you have discussions and debates. And you point out what's, um, what's, what, what might be workable and not workable and so on. And then she points out that knowledge by thinking can potentially reach farther than knowledge that by random selection because knowledge by thinking is capable of doing some kind of jumps which might not be possible in the natural selection process. Okay. Okay. Points out that the laws of physics do not guarantee the creation of knowledge, but they do allow it to happen. Um, I'm sorry, this should say they do not prevent it from happening. Okay. Not they do prevent it. They do not prevent it from happening. And points out that when we're talking about the possibility of something, the possibility of the, arise, the arising of knowledge, that's what she calls a counterfactual. The fact that knowledge is there is a fact, but the possibility that knowledge can arise is a counterfactual. Okay. Then goes on to point out that knowledge creation by accidental natural selection, like Darwinian selection, can stagnate because it's incapable of jumps. Every time you have a variation for that, var uh, for that new organism, it has to be able to survive in the environment in order to have another variation, another variation, another variation, and so on. Whereas um, knowledge creation by thinking can perform jumps because you can have a whole bunch of bad ideas out of which could suddenly emerge a good idea. So the bad idea doesn't necessarily have to be able to survive in the environment. It just has to survive long enough in the thinking process to, for a good idea to emerge out of it. Um, okay. So um, physical explanations in physics, we express what we see in terms of some explanations of what are unseen um, and all explanations have primitive elements, okay? She points out that if you base your explanations, our typical explanations are based on primitive elements, but if you base them in primitive elements, then you can always ask what's the primitive element forming that and goes on and on and on. You basically have turtles all the way down, right? So um, as a result, depending on what, you're, what level you're trying to uh, understand something at, you have a different explanation. Okay. Each of these is sort of a conjecture. So at, at the Newtonian level, you have explanations about the universe. At the quantum level, you have explanations about the universe. At the string theory level, you have explanations about the universe. And you have to sustain all of these different explanations. And they all have to somehow be consistent with each other. Uh, she points out that uh, in physics, uh, there's a tendency to not permit ex explanations that involve counterfactuals. That's a big beef in this book, okay? So as I said before, there's an unspoken stipulation that you have to formulate your physical theor theories in terms of initial conditions and laws of motions, and laws of motion. And these have been very successful. They've led to quantum theory, general relativity, which are current best theories. Um, but because this narrows the barrier, uh, creates barriers against counterfactual explanations, it tends to lead to a sort of reductionism where you have to have multiple levels of explanation. And taken literally, if you take this to its logical conclusion, uh, it seems like you could never really arrive at a sufficiently satisfactory explanation because if you have initial conditions, then you have to ask what caused those initial conditions and it becomes sort of an infinite regress. You also then have to ask the question, uh, what would have happened in the universe 
if a different set of initial conditions had been present. Okay, and that's a counterfactual. So you can't just, you're not just asking about this universe, but what other possible universes could have arisen if the con initial conditions had been different. Okay. Oh, and then um, you, uh, you, you, you would also need to explain why the dynamical laws, the laws of motions are the way they are. Why are they restricted to be that particular set of laws and not some other set of laws? Okay, so this leads to uh, limitations in physics. Oh, oh, Shane, do you want to pause a little bit to see? Sure. Anybody sure. Has a question on that chapter because it's a, it's a lot. Good point. Okay. Oh, Shane, a main... stupid question. I, I still don't get why she calls it counterfactual. It's counter means so. Um, it, it's not a fact in the sense of it can't be a fact, but what she's talking about is in, in fact things that could be facts but are just not seen. So I don't I like, get the idea. I let Praveen take that one, but I think you're right. Yeah, that's how I see it. things that have not happened. Um, but uh, when we consider the possibilities, they can happen. Those are the counterfactuals. And essentially everything that can happen that is permitted to happen falls in the realm of counterfactuals. So, and what happened is only a small subset of what could happen, what is permitted to happen. So, what we observe with data is only what has happened, not what could happen. Uh, so, could we say it simply a scenario analysis or something? That sounds reasonable. Yeah. Uh, so the scenario analysis would have a limited interpretation because the scenario analysis implies that you are potentially tweaking the initial conditions and seeing what other possibilities are there. So this is not just about tweaking the initial or the boundary condition. It's about phenomen phenomenological uh, situations where new things could potentially happen, right? So think about uh, climate change. So there is a certain pattern that is not permitted under existing temperature regimes. But if the temperature regimes were to shift, new things could potentially happen, which you guys are experiencing out there in the West, right? So that's a counterfactual <clears throat> uh, in there. Now it's become a fact, but 10 years ago, it would have been a counterfactual to imagine that you get persistent heat of the kind that you're seeing, right? Thanks. So it's, it's, it's much more than a, a scenario analysis. So uh, I have a question like, are these counterfactuals testable? Test because I see them more as hypothesis because there's no direct observation that can really test them. Well, the things about what is possible could work. Uh, by just observing it, but then the things about what isn't possible, how can that actually be tested? Uh, so uh, that's why I find this book very exciting because it challenges our existing methodologies for doing things, right? So uh, when uh, basically a counterfactual is, because it hasn't happened, is not necessarily testable but it's not precluded from happening, right? So, uh, so I think that's where things arise uh, in an interesting way uh, in thinking about this uh, approach. So I think what we're, it's probably worthwhile, or at least I found it worthwhile to step away from our traditional way of thinking to absorb this in there, right? So um, if it hasn't happened, uh, it's probably not testable unless you can imagine situations to make that happen, right? So uh, in the elementary particle world, they are already do, they do this thing, right? Uh, they theoretically find that this thing should happen and then go and uh, create a large hot and collider to basically make that happen, and it, they find it. So that is testable in that context through novel experimental design. 
uh, in our world of hydrology and climate and all those things, which are far more bigger and more complex system, trying to design those kind of experiment may be very difficult. And so testing will take a whole different view. Sorry guys, I don't know what happened, but I'm connecting through my phone. So hopefully that'll work. Okay. Okay, I gotta share again. Any other questions? Well, I think, yeah, Herman? Yeah, it seems to me like um, the book is leading us to the definition of something of a bigger value. Uh, like we could perhaps uh, classify or provide a value to something that has more information than something um, like a level of energy or something that you measure or heat in a, in a body or, or, or a, li a living organism. Um, but, but I don't know if she gets to the point at which she defines a, um, a level of importance to things that have more information or knowledge than others. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I think my takeaway message was uh, that this is a very early way of thinking about it. And so not all aspects are clarified. And uh, that team is trying to get to it from a very, in a manner that is consistent across many ways of thinking, uh, rather than picking one aspect and saying, okay, how can I do this thing? So whether something is important is a much higher level concept. I think resilience is uh, probably a lower level concept uh, in that regard, right? I mean, only if something is resilient, can you then start at adding value to it? So importance is a value added, whereas the resilience is an existential question. So I think that there probably are some differences in the way the thinking is. Okay, so she goes into chapter, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but uh, goes into a bunch of limitations of trying to explain things using laws of motion. I you know, recommend you read the, read the chapter, uh, but things like, uh, she goes to this explanation how you can't use laws of motion to explain a simple transformation like addition, um, that uh, you can't explain, accommodate the impossibilities, things that are impossible, uh, the possibility of choice, free will, a bunch of, there's a various bunch of things she goes through in this chapter, uh, and that it can't capture counterfactual properties. So um, as an example, she goes into quantum mechanics and thermodynamics. I'm going to leave aside quantum mechanics. You're going to have to read that, read that chapter for yourself, but I will cover uh, the thermodynamics uh, uh, aspect of her arguments. Okay. And then she points out that all of the properties central to understanding life and how it arises and sustains itself are essentially counterfactual. So uh, physics has been typically uh, had a lot of success with dealing with particles of matter. And the difficulty has been when you start to try to use physics to explain more complex structures like life. So, uh, yeah, okay. So principles like conservation of energy are about counterfactuals. And she points out that even, so as an example, when you talk about conservation of energy uh, or the conservation of mass or anything, while that is not a law of motion, it's still a very powerful way of explaining the universe. So it doesn't arise as a law of motion. It's not about initial conditions and, uh, and so on but it's still a way of explaining the universe and saying these are fundamental. So these are principles that seem to allow, be more primitive or more fundamental than laws of motion. And uh, she points out that uh, principles can be very powerful at generating predictions. You don't just need laws of motion. And it gives the example of the fact that based on um, uh, 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 principles, they were able to predict the existence of the neutri neutrino. So it was not a prediction based on laws of motion, it was based on a counterfactual argument. 
Uh, principles also appear in Newton's laws. So some transformations are impossible in the first law. Uh, third law that to every action, there must be an equal and opposite reaction. That's a principle, not a law of motion type of formulation. And she says the challenge is to place counterfactuals at a more primitive level, more fundamental level than the laws of motion. So uh, if you could do that, she claims that this would open up physics and provide a much more powerful basis for discovery and understanding. It would solve some of these problems of infinite regress. Uh, for example, you might, it might be able, possible to explain why the universe happens to be in the particular state it is without having to refer to initial conditions, okay? That arises out of principles and not as a consequence of a very specific set of initial conditions. Uh, she gives an example of chess as, uh, uh, for explaining counterfactuals, uh, pointing out that, for example, let's say you take a chess game and, at, and you get to a draw. You've got a single king on one side and a king and a bishop on the other side. Now you could try to explain this using laws of motion and initial conditions, going back to the beginning of the universe, okay? Um, so a draw is a uh, basically says you can't get to a checkmate, right? So the game ends, that's the end of the game. So it's expensive. You'd have to require this very massive amount of computing. Uh, it misses the point, which is that it doesn't really explain why it's a draw in the first place. And counterfactual explanation would be there's some rules of chess. According to these rules, only some moves are possible, others are impossible. And as a consequence, it's not possible for you to get to a checkmate. So it doesn't matter what the initial conditions are. We right here at this point in time with this arrangement of elements and because of the rules, we cannot get to a checkmate. And that's a counterfactual explanation that doesn't depend on laws of motion and initial conditions. Claims that this explanation is both more ex exhaustive and ex specific, uh, doesn't need to involve the rest of the universe, the minds of the players, the psychology of people and so on. And you can use it to make predictions because you can predict that under this from this situation, you will never get to checkmate. That's the prediction. It didn't require laws of motion to do that. Uh, well, assuming that the players stick to the rules of chess. So there's some differences to a counterfactual explanation as opposed to a law of motion explanation. One is that it doesn't look like a story unfolding in time. It just simply says there are some things, transformations that are possible, others that are impossible. It's independent of time. It doesn't matter how long uh, this, uh, it, it has nothing to do with how much time it takes for that system to evolve the chess game. And basically it requires you to think about what can and cannot happen. Okay. So that's her basic, uh, I, I went through it very quickly, but there's a whole chapter is basically trying to uh, point out why uh, the, the classical approach to trying to do physics is limited. I'll take a pause there and see if anybody wants to bring something up. Um, I have a quick question. So in a system where we don't know the dynamics, we still might need some observations, right? Like in the chess game to know what moves are, or what are the rules of the, of the game or the dynamics of the, of the system, right? So to know what transformation are, are possible or impossible to know, right? But if we don't have observations, then we don't know anything about the system, right? So we still need to describe the system in terms of what is possible by observations. I mean, I, I, I completely agree. If you don't have any observations on the universe, you can't even start considering it or contemplating it, right? But the point is, she's saying rather than trying to just limit it to discoveries about the laws of motion, you try to discover, you, you try to expand that to the discovery of what transformations are possible and impossible. Okay, so that is in absence of having a law of motion that describes that system or that balance that uh, put boundaries on the system. I don't think she's leaving out laws of motion. She's just saying that they're not everything. Good point. Thank you. She's trying to point out that 
that the focus is on transformations, understanding what transformations are possible and not possible. Right. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay. Um, so this is probably the interesting chapter for most people, the physical nature of information. So of course, Praveen has been pushing this, uh, uh, pushing us to consider this for a long time. And, I, uh, and uh, she has an interesting, nice take on it here. So, uh, and, and it's, quite, it's quite a nice logical take. Basically it says physical systems have the ability to carry information, okay? We normally think of it, we start learning about information theory as an abstract concept, but just basically pointing out a physical system has the ability to carry information. And we tend to think of information as being abstract because it's not tied to any very specific thing in the universe, okay? So it's not a property of one thing, it's a property of a class of things. This is the point she's making here. It's a property that information is a property that some systems have and whether, and then goes on to point out that whether a system uh, is able to contain information, whether a system contains information depends on whether certain transformations are possible on that system, okay? Specifically, how do you ask whether a system contains information or not? She says, basically take away uh, take away everything that you can take away from the system. And if you take away something and it means that the system can no longer carry information, then you've taken away something important. So throw away everything that you can and retain only the essentials that you need in order to be able to say that system can carry information. And she basically says, if you do that, you end up with two properties. One is that the system can flip between at least one of two states. So this is sort of the bit concept, binary zero one, yes, no. In other words, it can have at least two possible states that can exist, it can have many more than that. It has to be able to flip between states. And uh, you have to be able to perform the copy uh, um, operation, which means that whatever in one system you have that state, you can copy that state into another system. So, just the ability to flip by itself is not information. If that uh, information cannot then be transferred from one system to another, then it's not information. So information has this property of being able to be propagated from system to system uh, by, the, uh, by the copy operation, okay? So two things, flip and copy. And any uh, physical system which has the ability to do these two things, do a flip operation and a copy operation, she calls information media. So all, all, all systems that have the ability to do this are, are called information media. Anything which cannot do that cannot carry information. And so information is not a factual property of a system, like it has color or it has mass. You don't say it has information. You say the information, uh, you say the system is capable of carrying information, right? It's a different way of talking about it. So it's a counterfactual property. It, it, the information, the system has the possibility of carrying information. And whether it has that possibility or not depends on those two properties. So not every system is an information medium. And uh, furthermore, the ability of a system to carry information or not depends on the laws of physics. So it's not like just something which is independent of the laws of physics. The laws of physics determine what kinds of systems can carry information and the laws of, based on whether the laws of physics enable, allow that system to do a copy and flip, flip and copy operations. And goes on to say, there's a counterfactual statement in a universe where there was no system in that universe that had both copy and flip operations, information would not exist. So let me pause there because that's a kind of a key critical uh, part of our argument.
Oshin? Yes. May I ask a quick question? Yes. Are you there, Ui? We can't hear you. Are you still there, Uri? Somebody else in the meantime? Just a quick comment. Uh, I mean, I found this characterization in some ways bringing down information to its essence, right? And also generalizing it. Um, the way we think about information, um, either we think about in terms of the Shannon's characterization. Surprise, yeah. Or the more abstract that it is anything uh, that we learn. Whereas this one is not anchored on either of those. It just gives a more, more precise and more intuitive definition of information that there should be more than one possible things that can happen. Only then we have information. You have complete sense certainty, then you don't have information. That's consistent with Shannon's definition, right? Uh, it makes it very physical. For yeah, me. makes it very physical, exactly. And then you can then talk about information in physical systems rather than in just communication uh, thing and or just as a statistical uh, aspect of or a statistical attribute of a signal. So. I see Uwe's back. We didn't hear your question earlier, Uwe. Okay, yeah, I got kicked out somehow. So I was just wondering whether this copy property is not a property of an outside system that does the copying and not that system itself. Could be both. The system could make copies uh, of things within itself or it could be uh, something outside that's copying it. Yeah, I think, so in, uh, sorry, go ahead. Didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, did, uh, in living things, when uh, DNA does replication, that would be like doing a copy operation within, it depends on what you're calling the system, of course. But. Yeah, go ahead, I, Praveen. I, I don't know if you're gonna mention this, but she talks about measurement essentially being a copying operation. Right. right. So basically saying when you're measuring something, you're copying the state of that system uh, in there. Right. And therefore, it's a propagation of information. So suppose you were out there in the field and measuring stream uh, stage uh, and the stream stage is changing and therefore it contains information. And then when you are just documenting it as a number in your spreadsheet, you're copying that information and you're creating information in your spreadsheet. And uh, so this copying is a pretty broad concept uh, in there. Replication is the other word she uses. It's right. copying, yeah. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask a quick question. Um, uh, in the first chapter, or maybe uh, long before that, so there is a, sentence something says like uh, if you have a computer and uh, there is memory so you can store like different types of information but if it comes like all filled so that indicates uh, you have no information so i want to take this analogy in terms of uh, in regards to a book which is like uh, you don't change anything you just read the book so does it mean like book does not have any information uh, or uh, how do we relate this with Shannon's concept? Like uh, with um, with certainty, there is not uh, much information or any information. The other thing I was thinking of as you were talking about was that if the tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear, it doesn't make a sound, right? I mean, these are the sort of uh, paradoxes that people have to deal with. Uh, but it, it seems to me that information has to do with uh, something that is conveyed, right? It's contained and conveyed. 
So there's sort of that concept that if you can contain it, but if it's not conveyed, it doesn't, doesn't have the ability of being conveyed somehow, it's not information, according to this definition. Yeah, no, I'm not saying it's correct. No. Yeah, but there is a more trivial uh, interpretation of this. Imagine two books of 200 pages each. One has all complete blank pages and the other one is printed. So the one which is printed has information. The one which is blank does not. And that information in the printer is arising because of the black and white pattern. If you didn't have the flip between the black and white or any other two, for two possible states, this book would not contain information. So it is containing information because of the pattern. Uh, for that matter, if you look at Oshin's slide, if it was all white, it would contain nothing, but the flip between black and white is creating what the information, right? So. But it's the fact that I'm copying it when I read it that makes it information in some sense, because it was black and white and I wasn't looking at it. It would sort of be a, the tree in the forest kind of thing. It will still contain information, not just for us. Yeah. So, I mean, definitely there is a need for an interpretation mechanism, right? I mean, if there, if there is a pattern and you cannot interpret it, it doesn't have the information for us, but that pattern itself is containing information for whoever is interpreting it uh, in certain ways. Right? Although, although she points out, she does go at length to point out that this definition of information doesn't require a subjective component. That's true. And yeah. it, it doesn't uh, require a subjective component, but it probably, requires interactive components. Some, some it just part. requires interaction, yeah. Right? And so that was the thing that we have been trying to exploit with uh, signals in natural systems, right? If basically um, there's temperature and humidity, they are interacting in some way. That is related to information. It's natural whether however we want to think about it is irrelevant in there. So that's one example. So, um, sorry, Hoshin, but in, Go ahead. Um, it seems to me like the, from this slide, she's trying to define uh, information media in terms of some physical properties of, of, yes. of, of itself. And, and it seems to me that she's going to probably to the point at which the information seems to be dependent on the mass of, of the physical properties like mass or perhaps energy or perhaps flow. Yes, and, she's making it very physical. Yeah. Right. Yeah, her whole point is to make these things which are normally considered abstract to be actual uh, properties that can be studied by physics. Yeah. Sure, thanks. Um, so uh, uh, actually this sort of extension what we were just talking about is that the information media have the property of being interoperable, interoperable meaning that whatever flip and copy uh, operations you can perform on one media, you can perform it on another media. So the same information could be carried and conveyed in one medium, could it be carried and conveyed by a different form of medium, which could have a completely different kind of structure. Okay, so the information itself is not tied to any specific physical media. It can, it can um, be propagated through or contained in or expressed by many different kinds of physical media. And all of those kinds of media, which he calls interoperable. Um, without this idea of interoperability, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have the ability to have computers. And then uh, this is just repetition. The laws of physics govern which computations or transformations can and cannot be performed. Computations and transformations are basically the same thing. And because computers embodied in physical report uh, supports. This gives rise to the possibility of the universal computer. So the idea of the Turing machine and you know, the, 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 the fundamental computer, which can perform all possible physically allowed computations. And um, points out that, so you can have all possible physically allowed computations, whatever they are, these become an object of the study of physics. And in principle, uh, all such physically allowed computations could be then studied in terms of some elementary computations. So you try to discover what's this universal set of fundamental basic operations, which, which uh, subscribe to the laws of physics, which are con controlled by the laws of physics. And then you can build more and more complex operations out of them. 
And so the moment you have interoperability, you can have a ver various, uh, a whole possibility of many other kinds of transformations, uh, things like information technology, life, which involves reproduction, intelligence, thinking, all the higher level things, which typically were not part of the realm of physics, she claims now become part of the realm of physics. And then this is the point I mentioned earlier that if you use this approach of counterfactuals, uh, you no longer need to think of information in terms of meaning to somebody. So it's no longer subjective. Basically, if you uh, can copy something, it doesn't require there to be an observer or a conscious subject or somebody who's thinking about it to perform that operation. The fact that the operation is copied from here to here just means that information has been involved. Take a pause right there. So the main concept here is this idea of interoperability, which makes possible more complex um, operations and the possibility of something called a universal computer. Not, not to distract from what you're saying, Hoshan, but just occurred to me that the example of the book with blank pages and printed pages used counterfactual to explain a concept. Nice, yeah. Yeah. So as long as there was a, an operation, a machine, which takes the, the, the patterns on one book and transforms it to another book, then information has been involved, whether or not a person was reading that book. the possibility of that being able to happen. Okay. All right, so that's about information. She then goes into an interesting discussion of quantum information, but I'm not going to go into it because she points out that um, something to do with the fact that in quantum information, you talk about things that are possible, but you also think to talk about things that are impossible. And because there are certain impossibilities associated with quantum mechanics or quantum information, this gives rise to more possibilities. So it's a little convoluted uh, and it's very interesting, but I'm not gonna cover it here and I encourage you to read this chapter, but that's what that chapter is about. Okay. Um, what I do wanna do is continue that conversation about information and transformations to the, new, to the concept she then introduces based on this called catalysts, abstract catalysts, and then definition of knowledge. There's a little bit more about knowledge. So uh, back to elementary particles. Uh, there are some things that because of the laws of physics, they're just very abundant in the universe. Okay, they're not hard to come by. Elementary constituents of matter, elementary particles, okay, fields, naturally occurring systems, naturally occurring interactions. The laws of physics, the way they are, means that there are lots of these in the universe, okay? Um, and those particles interact and certain transformations occur, but most transformations that happen in physics do not happen, she says, she claims, reliably. In other words, they're not reliable and they're not successful and they don't, they don't sustain, they're, they're not resilient. Okay. To explain the fact that certain transformations that you observe in the universe happen accurately and reliably over and over and over again, like DNA replication, giving rise to life, formation of planets, uh, whatever you want to talk about, you need, uh, she claims, the concept of a catalyst. So everybody knows what a catalyst is from your um, chemistry classes. It's that thing that has to be present in order for a transformation to occur, a reaction to occur. And the other property of the catalyst is that at the end of the reaction, the catalyst is still there. It's not gone away, right? It's not affected. It's not eaten up or used up by the, the operation of the transformation. Okay. So, um, a cat, uh, a, uh, you, so in order to have transformations to happen accurately and reliably, you need the concept of a catalyst that can perform the transformation. 
And you need a particular kind of resilient information that she calls knowledge, which we defined. So what's a catalyst system that enables a transformation without itself being changed? And in particular, because it's not changed, it's a self, it's a self-perpetuating or it's a resilient system. So a catalyst is a resilient system because it retains the ability to cause that transformation over and over and over again. Uh, by enables, we mean that that transformation only occurs when the catalyst is present, like certain chemical reactions. And she claims that if you look at any, any transformation that occurs in physical reality, you should be able to identify unambiguously the catalyst, the thing that makes that transformation possible and without which that transformation won't occur. Okay. A short pause there. So the moment Hoshin, we talk uh, about... Hoshin? Yeah. Why, why does she claim that uh, now a catalyst has to be present? And before it sounded more like um, a catalyst can be present to enable something, but um, it's not a must. So does she claim it must be there, it's always there, or it can be there? My, my reading of the book is the statement, she says unambiguously identify a catalyst means that she claims that there, without a catalyst, there is no transformation. And the fundamental transformations of the, of the um, for example, if you've got particles that convert uh, from one particle to, to another because of collisions and so on, right? That's a transformation. In that case, the, the catalysts are the laws of physics themselves. So there's fundamental catalysts, which are the laws of physics because they enable and sustain certain transformations. But then there are more complex catalysts, which are recipes of the kind we talked about uh, earlier, which we're gonna to get to on the next slide. So the claim is that there, there's no possibility of transformation without something that mediates the transformation. I haven't thought about it enough to come up with, a, with it, whether there's a counter example, but that's the claim. Hoshin, I have a quick question. So is the catalyst a property of the system that is able to make a transformation, but it's not an element that needs to be present? So it is a system itself, the catalyst? My interpretation is the catalyst is a kind of resilient information. But it's a little ambiguous because it could be just a property of uh, raw constituents, right? Mm -hmm. Like in chemistry, a certain raw constituent has to be present because it mediates the transformation. At the end of the transformation, it's not changed, but right. it's engaged in the transformation. But it could be something more high level. So that's a very good question. I, I think it requires deeper thinking to understand uh, the full ramifications of the idea of a catalyst. So from the idea of a catalyst, she goes to the idea of an abstract catalyst. So she, point, she claims that system resilience, the ability of a complex structure to sustain itself requires the existence of something she calls an abstract catalyst. And that abstract catalyst is exactly the recipe that we talked about before, the algorithm, like in the DNA, which is, which is sustained there, which is the recipe for bringing about the transformation. And that's what she calls the abstract catalyst, right? It's the recipe to be able to make, make a cake. So an abstract catalyst is a catalyst that is both resilient and can be copied. So whereas a catalyst previously, uh, the chemical catalyst we're talking about was a catalyst, but it wasn't, wasn't necessarily something that was copied because it wasn't information media per se. In this case now, which is talking about is an abstract catalyst, which is an extension of the concept of catalyst in that it's both resilient, means it's self perpetuating and it can be copied from one information media to another. It's like a blueprint of a building. I mean, there you go. It, it can be sustained and you can copy and make as many buildings as you want out of that blueprint. 
So it's abstract because its identity doesn't depend on the physical system. It's a property of systems per se, and it's resilient because it remains instantiated, it survives. And since we called resilient information knowledge, then essentially abstract catalysts are knowledge. Okay. And then just this definition doesn't require a knower. So it's again, just like information is a physical property of the universe. So now this definition makes knowledge a physical property of the universe. Okay. So this, this challenges a lot of the notions that we have when we are thinking about hydrologic process and prediction and all that, because I mean, to us, knowledge requires what we know, but in this case, it's just a property of the system that we're studying. Right. Um, it then goes on to say all catalysts must contain an abstract catalyst. This is because of the laws of physics. And the catalyst must have the structure of a sequence of steps, and that's because of the laws of physics. Um, uh, only very simple types of transformations can be performed reliably without the need for a recipe. This is what I said earlier about uh, the fact that elementary particles can interact and certain transformations can occur. In that case, the laws of physics themselves are the catalyst. Um, and then basically just basically saying that has to be made up of a sequence of steps. So you can trace all of this back down to the fundamental laws of physics. Okay, so by this definition, that knowledge is made up of resilient information, information that has the ability to sustain itself. Um, it's a, so knowledge becomes a particular property that matter can have in the universe, just like information. Knowledge exists whenever an abstract catalyst is present. It's a kind of information that can enable its own self-perpetuation. And uh, just to repeat something I said earlier, the best way to define this kind of information or knowledge is that it's exactly the thing that you would have to eliminate to, particular, to prevent a particular operation or transformation from being performed reliably. Right. So that abstraction process requires you to basically strip away, take away everything that's non-essential, reduce it to its essentials, which I like in a sense, because that in a sense is the way we think of science, right? It's stripping it away to the fundamental things that we need in order to be able to explain something. And then this makes knowledge a topic of study for physics. Um, in other words, Basically, now you can say knowledge might have some regularities. You can study how it comes into existence, how it evolves, when it, whether it can be sustained, whether it can grow indefinitely or whether it will disappear. All of the things that we think about as properties of particles of matter, we can think of as being uh, things that physics in principle could study. Information, uh, resilience, uh, uh, knowledge, so on. Okay. Um, any discussion on that? We have a long way to go in this last part. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so now she applies this idea to thermodynamics. And she picks on thermodynamics because it's one of the places where physics has had a lot of uh, challenges trying to apply the laws of motion, initial condition kind of thing to physics. Okay. Okay, we talked about information, but now we're talking about energy. And so energy is an abstract property of physical systems. It's a property that systems can have. And in that sense, it's like information, but not exactly, okay? Energy is subject to the law of conservation of energy, first law of thermodynamics. Energy is interchangeable from one interacting system to another. And this is kind of like information. Information can be moved. So you might think that in energy, uh, energy systems are interoperable. And, but she points out that in due to thermodynamics, we know that energy systems are not actually fully interoperable. Okay. This is just a statement that the conservation of energy principle is more general than any dynamical law. Um, and then that the laws of thermodynamics point provide the theoretical foundation for heat engines, just like the laws of information provide the theoretical foundation for computers. Okay. So, as I said, 
interchangeability of energy and energy systems might seem similar to interoperability of information media, but it turns out that only some of the systems that embody energy are interoperable with respect to energy exchanges in the sense that if you take inf information from one uh, media and transfer it to another media, you can then take it back. Okay, you can transfer, you can copy it from here to here and you can copy it back to here without it being changed. Okay, but that's not true of energy systems. So in the law of thermodynamics, you have two types of energy transfers, things that are called work-like transformations. Work-like transformations are reversible, right? Like when you lift an object up and you give it potential energy and you take, bring it back down, um, pulleys, levers, all kinds of things. So these are work-like transformations. These are reversible. They can be undone. And any type of uh, system, energy uh, media, which can do reversible transformations is fully operable. Okay, you can transform the energy from here to here and then you can take it back. But heat-like transformations are considered to be irreversible. They cannot be fully undone, uh, which means that some once you do a heat-like transformation, some capacity to continue to do work is lost. And this is what we think of as entropy in thermodynamics. She points out that the this is not something I'm very familiar with, but she claims that the second law of thermodynamics becomes ambiguous when applied to engines that operate that nanoscale, because at that scale, the distinction between work-like and, and heat-like transformations becomes a little bit more ambiguous because of the size of the particles, I guess. And the requirement for, so in, in heat-like transformations, you have, possibility of some reversibility, but the, irre the possibility of irreversibility clashes with the laws of motion because the laws of physics, the laws of motion um, uh, and so on basically require that you can start anywhere and you can basically reverse and go backward all the way to the beginning of time or forward to the end of time. Um, and so they require full reversibility, whereas thermodynamics brings up this possibility of not having full reversibility. Um, there's a long discussion of how people have tried to dis address this issue. Uh, one being that to basically think of them as statistical operations. And uh, I'm skipping that entire discussion over here. You can read about it. But basically, she points out that if you use statistical explanations for this irreversibility, um, that it's due to laws of large numbers and so on and so forth, that you get at best an approximate law. You don't get a and physics wants exact laws. She wants laws to be exact. The laws of motion are exact. So she says this uh, results in approximate uh, laws of physics and uh, laws of thermodynamics and finds those to be not very satisfactory. So then she brings this concept of counterfactuals to bear and says we can instead look at thermodynamics from a counterfactual point of view. And we can consider instead the possibilities of types of transformations. Remember, we had two types of transformations, work-like transformations and heat-like transformations that we need to deal with. So uh, Kelvin, Lord Kelvin and Max Planck proposed that you could instead address the second law of thermodynamics by saying that it has to do with whether certain transformations are possible by certain means only. Okay, so not just talking about the transformations, but the mechanisms required to um, make those transformations uh, possible. So uh, that means a particular transformation is possible by a certain means only, and you cannot do the reverse transformation just by the same operations, right? So if a particular transformation is up possible by physical means, uh, if you cannot, uh, you may not be able to do the reverse transformation using only physical means. You'd have to use some other mechanism, not just the, um, uh, the mechanism which is used to go from A to B, okay? So if you use this argument, this, this concept, then you can say that work-like transformations are those that can go in both directions, possible in both directions by mechanical means. So you've got a pulley, you go one way, that's a mechanical thing. You can go the other way, that's a mechanical thing. 
So you can go from one state to another and it's the same operation is physical in one way in direction that's physical in the other direction or mechanical. Whereas heat-like transformations are going to be defined as those that are possible only in one direction by mechanical means, but you cannot reverse them using only mechanical means and nothing else. You have to do something else besides something mechanical in order to reverse them. So this is explaining um, uh, the fact of energy dispersion and in, in, uh, sort of energy loss in systems, but it's using a counterfactual explanation rather than a laws of motion explanation. Okay, so we're not changing what we're saying about the universe, we're just changing how we explain it and we're using counterfactual explanations. Um, she claims that counterfactual ir irreversibility still remains compatible with time reversible symmetrical laws, but now there's no approximations required. You don't have to make statistical arguments or anything like that. You're just saying certain things are possible, certain things are not possible. And um, so even under perfectly reversible microscopic laws, you can have transformations that are only possible in one direction but not possible in the reverse direction. So this is a consequence. So the laws of physics allow this to happen, basically. Uh, this irreversibility is different from statistical because it's a statement about what's possible or not possible. And so now the second law of thermodynamics could be ex uh, expressed differently, call, call it the counterfactual second law, as saying, there must be heat-like transfers in our universe. Okay. That's her restatement of the second law of thermodynamics. And she says, this formulation is applicable to all scales, nano or whatever, it's independent of the kind of system and it's exact. Okay, so that's a pretty deep concept there. So I'll stop there for a moment. So we're not changing anything about the universe. We're just changing our explanations of it. Hashim, quick question. Is it fair to make an analogy of these concepts of work-like and heat-like, saying that work-like are the ones that are physical reactions and heat-like those that are kind of chemical reactions, like in chemical reactions when you cannot have reversibility? is kind of the same concept? I don't think it's entirely physical because you can have loss of uh, heat through friction, which is a physical operation. Mm -hmm. So there can I, be some physicals that are not, uh, that are not work-like, but heat-like. Right. right. Yes. Or combinations of work-like and heat-like. Yeah. Yes. But I guess most of the chemical reactions are heat-like. I'm not an expert on this, somebody else. <laughs> okay, Louis, we need that. Louis, can you say anything about this? I guess you gave a good example that friction is a physical process because you don't change the molecular or atomic structure of something and still you dissipate energy to a microscopic level where you don't... Um, allow energy transfers on a macroscopic level that can be distinguished so i think what she's a little bit avoiding is you know the concept of a microscopic and a macroscopic level you mentioned it hoshin that at um, um the scale the, the, the nanoscale where the two uh, notions get blurred somehow and that's exactly where the concept of a macro and a micro scale um just collapses she doesn't actually go into it in the chapter. I think she probably avoids it because she wants this to be a book readable by the general public. So uh, that's a missing, to me, there was something missing in that chapter explaining, you know, she just, she just says at the nanoscale, this becomes blurred and doesn't really go into explain why. Uh, I always liked the uh, example of like a video of a snooker table. 
And uh, if, if you have an initial configuration and you have the video, you can clearly tell from the first shot uh, which direction time goes. But then if you zoom in to one collision between two balls, then actually playing it in reverse looks just as natural as the other one, right? So it's, uh, it's about the complexity of the system uh, because you actually need to lose track of the of the energy into this microscopical state. So if you have many elements in there, it's easier to look, lose track of that energy than if it's a simple system. So yeah, so, so it's basically about uh, identifying the arrow of time. Uh, like you mm. cannot do that if you zoom into a simple system but for a more complex system you can but yeah I, i'm still not sure how she <laughs> gets around not making it a statistical thing because i, I think well yeah. i think what she wants to say is that you define things as being possible and impossible um and then, then, then you build your explanations based on possibility and impossibility rather than based on statistical arguments of probability. Yeah, but I, I always understood that entropy can decrease momentarily. It's just very unlikely. But yeah, maybe. And that, that's the argument she's trying to counter, I guess. But I, I'm not saying, yeah. I'm not saying it's, it's completely clear to me. I'm just saying that that's, she's trying to make an argument about possibility and possibility versus probability. Yeah. Because she wants an ex exact explanation as opposed to a, a, an approximate explanation. And I, I, I presume these are things that the physics community is debating. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then there's a link between uh, thermodynamics and information theory. It says work media are in fact information media. So any work media, which is something that can transform energy from one place to another and you can bring it back without any loss, right? Of ability to do work. It's like information media, but information media are not necessarily all work media. Yeah. Um, so there's a similarity between reversible energy exchanges and copying transformations because you can do them in both directions. Um, which means that systems that can perform work-like transfers of energy can also store information, right? It's just information stored in the form of energy. And this links, she claims, this links information theory of computers with thermodynamics, heat engines. And then there's videos that you can go online uh, where she's now exploring this possibility where she said, this suggests the possibility of more general branch of physics, which links information theory and thermodynamics. Um, possible that you could then arrive at fundamental universal principles that are more fundamental than the laws of motion and the laws of motion arise out of them, so to speak. And this then raises the possibility of something which we now are comfortable with the notion of a universal computer, this would be the notion of a universal constructor, okay? Where uh, instead of it just being about information, it's about actually making things. This possibility was first proposed by John von Neumann and a universal constructor would be a machine that is capable or a system, sorry, that would be capable of all physically permitted transformations. This goes beyond computation to construction and all the operations that this system would be able to perform are all the operations that are thermodynamically allowed, such as cooling systems, biological, self-reproduction, all kinds of things like that. Oops, sorry. And I believe you can, uh, I believe Leela linked in our um, uh, uh, information about this meeting, a link to a video which where, she, where uh, Chiaro talks about universal constructors. And I haven't watched that one yet, so I'm not sure what she says, but I know there's a whole bunch of videos where people are talking about the possibility of going from universal computing to universal construction. So creating sort of the ultimate machines.
any discussion of that? Otherwise, I've just got a few more slides to finish up and then Praveen's got a really nice thing which can provoke some discussion. Okay. Okay, so that was chapter six. Chapter seven basically saying, this is sort of a summary. Science has neglected class of property of physical systems. She claims this is preventing progress. Uh, these properties that are being neglected are called counterfactuals. Basically, a system can't be completely specified by its state and laws of motion. Instead of thinking about a system in terms of state and laws of motion, we use a different way of thinking about systems in terms of what transformations are possible or impossible to perform on it. Okay. So like a watershed, we would think of as a system that has the ability to transform rainfall into runoff or in soil moisture and evaporation or whatever. You think of it in terms of the transformations, the processes that are occurring within the system. Examples of counterfactuals include interoperability, the no cloning, pro uh, this is something which I didn't talk about in the quantum information thing. The ability uh, that knowledge is, a really, is really resilient information, conservation of energy principle, distinction between work and heat like transfers, interoperability of information um, uh, based uh, work uh, uh, of work media, uh, and so on. You could, you know, basically list of examples. Um, if you took a counterfactual approach, you would try to establish exact and universal laws which have counterfactuals, what is possible and not possible as the universal elements. Uh, these should all be expressible as statements about what transformation is possible and which are not and why. This uh, kind of explanation focuses on what can and cannot be made to happen rather than what is happening or what has happened. Um, counterfactual properties are physical but they are they're not dependent on the details, most of the details of the physical systems. They are properties that are shared by classes of systems. Um, and then she says there's a logic, there's a sort of unifying logic about how to do this. You first look at the system and you first ask what is the counterfactual property required uh, for the system to embody some particular property? You then look at regularities about those systems having those counterfactual properties. You group together all the systems having the same counterfactual properties, look for regularities, look for in interoperability laws and so on. And uh, this means that you're using this concept of abstraction and which allows you to bring information and knowledge into the domain of physics and entities that are traditionally considered approximate like information, energy, heat work, et cetera, now can be expressed in terms of exact principles or laws. Uh, and then this is a speculation that the laws of physics can be expressed solely in terms of principles about counterfactuals. She says this would revolutionize our understanding of knowledge and creativity. Knowledge becomes a physical entity, independent observers. Creativity is simply the ability to create new knowledge. So if you can study knowledge as a topic of physics, then you can also study creativity as a topic of physics. And this relates to my interest in something I emailed a bunch of you people about where I said, you know, we it would be interesting to study the topic of uh, how models are used for discovery, it's a form of creative process. Other related issues that can enter the domain of science, um, such as uh, the possibility that other systems can have creative abilities, such as alien or artificial intelligence, uh, the study of how knowledge arises, uh, to understand thinking or creativity. Uh, then she goes uh, to some very fringe, so for example, can death be deferred by error correction? So if, you know, this would mean defining life in terms of information, and so, uh, is it possible to take that information and store it and correct it in such a way that um, death doesn't happen, actually happen? You know, science fiction writers have talked about this. Or could a person be copied, stored, and downloaded, as many science fiction movies uh, try to talk about? Okay. All right. And I'll leave this one to Praveen. 
Oh, you actually uh, drew this diagram for me. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I liked it so much. I wanted it to be a part of that record. Thank you. Uh, so before uh, I get into this thing, I just wanted to point out that about a decade ago, uh, I had written a paper, uh, I'm putting the UI in the chat box, it's called Typology of uh, Hydrologic Predictability. And uh, that paper basically talked about two types of predictions, like for lack of anything better, I called it type F and type N. And type F was essentially predicting the future of a trajectory. And that's basically trying to predict based on initial conditions. And type N is basically predicting uh, the phenomena that are possible, novel phenomena, uh, basically trying to think about what is possible, even though that may not be happening as we observe it, right? And uh, my argument was that we need both. Uh, and the type N is probably a stronger hypothesis because if you pose a hypothesis of an emergent phenomena that this thing should happen, and if it happens or you can make it to happen, then that's a stronger way to predict uh, and have veracity in your prediction. And so that is essentially a counterfactual because it hasn't happened and you're trying to say what can happen, right? So some of that uh, argument goes into this diagram, uh, think of- was... Pra Praveen, uh, if I could just, so all of technology basically, right? Human technology arouse, arises in some sense out of counterfactuals. Right. Yeah, and I'm going to talk about that in this uh, context okay. as well. So what I was trying to do in this thing after I read the book was to just think about the world uh, or the universe as you may. And it has two possible things, which is what is not possible and what is possible, right? And so what is possible has to be consistent with the laws of nature, whatever they are, whether we know them and have articulated or yet to discover, right? And within that, there are two possibilities, uh, which is what has happened or has been observed, and then what is not yet observed or documented. And that what is not yet observed or documented could be because it hasn't happened, but is possible, or it hasn't happened because it's not possible, right? So, uh, it's forbidden by the laws of nature and therefore we haven't observed it or we just, it hasn't happened. So my question then was basically, what are the implications of some of these things not having occurred? And these things not having occurred is because are there stronger barriers of activation energy to overcome for this to happen, which has naturally not happens? or uh, these are ones which require confluence of interactions that have not yet happened or are not persistent. They may happen episodically, but they have not been um, persistent. Uh, but some of them are being made possible through human ingenuity. So for example, nature would never have built the computers as we see it, but computers are not violating any laws of nature right? And so we are building them. Uh, so they're consistent with what is possible, but they are essentially a counterfactual uh, from what we know 100 years ago, right? Uh, but they have been built. Having said that, I mean, there is natural computation, which is what quantum computers are attempting to exploit. They are exploiting the natural way in which nature computes. Um, and so, for our purpose and harnesses. So that is technological uh, marvel and uh, that analogy can be carried out to all possible technologies that we develop, right? We build based on what we know, layers and layers of knowledge and design. So that then goes into this green and purple space, what is not yet observed, but is possible and what has happened and observed and so you take the union of that space and start thinking about what is possible. And the biggest example is climate change, right? So we are in an era of climate change as humans, which we have, as humans have never seen before. And so what we are gonna see is 
a combination of what has happened before and what is possible but has not happened uh, before. Uh, so this is a whole big question. Is this coincidental on initial conditions? Or is there higher likelihood of incidence due to other related interactions? Do you cross certain activation thresholds? Do you create new interactions? Do you create new patterns of persistence of these interactions that uh, give rise to it? So I think the way, one way to think about non-stationarity in any form is this collision of uh, what we has happened and what is a counterfactual, what hasn't happened. And it's that union of that space that we need to be thinking. So while this book was provocative in, and motivated from fundamental physics, I think in a lot of what we do and what we think about, uh, which is to a large extent reliant on fundamental physics, but uh, more higher level, there are implications of these things uh, in there. So it's, I think, I found it provocative and I was halfway through the book when I shared it with everybody saying, hey, I can't put this book down. And uh, not just because of the concept, I think the writing style is fantastic in there with some fiction, uh, uh, fictional elements to illustrate certain concepts in there. So I'll stop with that. And I think uh, other people who have read the book, if they want to weigh in, uh, and discuss with those who haven't. I mean, that would be great. Yeah, I thanks Praveen and Hoshin for preparing this summary for us. It was tremendously, you know, important. And I, what I can say about Praveen's last slide is probably the concept of non-stationarity that is related to what we don't know uh, in terms of the, for example, of all hydrologic theory, all design we do for civil engineers and everything does not include what we haven't seen yet, which is the, which is the green box that Praveen showed there. So, uh, so there's multiple applications beyond climate change potentially to, to this. And I, another reflection that I have is the, what Hoshin was saying, and I think it was Steve also, when he talked about counterfactuals and the fact that the catalyst that Hoshin mentioned, um, she relied too much in the laws of physics, a little on the new data, the, the statistical, uh, the, the more, you know, the, 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 the counterfactuals actually, um, which I believe rule a lot of the, a lot of the catalysts that occur in nature that are not understood yet well by the laws of physics. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's a great book. Thank you again for, for being in it today. I'm surprised she didn't actually mention as a counterfactual the speed of light, you know, but the idea of you can't travel faster than the speed of light, but presumably that's, that's a good example of a counterfactual, which is putting limits on what is possible. Anybody else wants to say something, Rain? So if there is a no further discussion, I think Uwe brought up a point uh, earlier. Uh, so this reading group was born out of uh, this information theory annual meeting discussion we had last year. And uh, for various reasons, was it last year or two years ago? I can't remember. Two years ago. And uh, we, no, no, last year. Uh, we had the virtual meeting last year. Yes, last year. Uh, last year, yeah. And uh, so this was a way for us to read about new things, think about new ideas, connect with each other rather than on, on, on an annual basis. Uh, it looks like we cannot have an in-person annual meeting again this year because of all travel restrictions and so forth. But we didn't reach a consensus whether we should do it virtually. And 
I think last year's virtual meeting was well done and um, useful. So I was thinking we we'll try to do it again, maybe like over a two or a three day period. We did it over two day period, right? So four hours each uh, kind of a thing. Uh, and uh, think of a theme. So it's not be a series of presentation, but thinking about this unknown emerging space of the linkage between information and physics and artificial intelligence and uh, scientific discovery. Uh, I think there is, there, there's in their own ways independent concept, but there's a lot of overlapping space where we could start exploring. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. I don't know if Ben is willing to organize, but it's probably very easy to do, so I can do it. Yeah, a while ago, Ben was asking in who would be joining possibly and whether it should be an online or an in-person format, but then I think he's just very busy, so it, it somehow got stuck. And if we can now arrange at least an online meeting, it would be nice. Yeah, I would also be interested in joining an online meeting. And I think regardless of that, we should continue with this, this series. I think uh, it has been very rewarding and interesting, so. Okay, so I'll get in touch with Ben and see if he wants to move forward with the organizing or uh, if he doesn't do it, uh, I can do it pretty easily. Uh, my question is what's on the reading list for next time? Yeah, that is a good question. So uh, we have two options. One option is to keep discussing this book if something else appears or if somebody else has ideas and also then uh, he volunteered to to host the next meeting whether it is this the next one or the next the the after one it is about the method um it is not right here i'm gonna share it in the chat box okay Hoshin, can you send this nice slide to me? <laughs> Thanks, Hoshin. We can't hear you, you're muted. I said I'll send out the whole thing, so everybody has a copy. But I'll send you the PowerPoint. I mean, you might want to animate that one. So. <laughs> um, oh, who was going to talk about symbolic regression? That was a good one, yeah. Yes, and then? Oh, Could Dan, you... oh, AI mm -hmm. Feynman, yeah. Yeah, so I guess the idea was to highlight the link between uh, the method that's proposed and uh, Solomonoff induction, which I guess is the, the information theory link. Yeah. Okay, so let's plan to do this, uh, this paper. Uh, Dan, you'll lead the discussion in three weeks. And then in the meantime, we'll try and figure out a meeting time for the everybody. Uh, and does anybody have any res date restrictions right now? I mean, I'm thinking it could be like previous times, the first week of August kind of a thing. I have one, let me just check. Um, First week of August looks good. Yeah. First and second weeks look good. Okay. Yeah, there is a small pro. How about last week of July? Does anybody have a problem with that? Um, um, the last week of July, I don't know if I'm attending, but some others may. Uh, 
there's something called Trustworthy AI for Environmental Science Summer School. Some of you may have received yeah. that. Um, I have also registered for that. Okay. I, I haven't received that. Maybe uh, Hoshin, you can point me to that one somehow. Okay, I'll send it out to, uh, I'll send it to Leela and she can send it to the mailing list. Okay. Uh, so, all right, so let me, let's uh, figure out some dates. Uh, there are planning to go to India and uh, I had booked tickets in July, uh, but um, just today, India announced that they will continue to not allow international flights until end of next month. They had it curtailed until end of this month, but so I won't be leaving until end of, until first week of August. So that's my only thing, but uh, we can probably find some date somehow. So, all right, I'll get in touch with Ben and see what, what we can do. Leela, I just put it in the chat window. Yes, I will share it with everyone in the in the email okay. with the recording session. Yes. Thank you, Professor Kumar. Thank you, Hoshin, for for the for the awesome description of the book. It was a very good suggestion and uh, it was a delight to to read it. So thank you and hopefully we'll see each other in three weeks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Ui. Ui. I know you said Friday was not possible. Um, I could talk on Thursday if that works for you. Or you want to wait till next week. Yeah, tomorrow I'm also, when, when your morning is uh, in the evening, I'm on an excursion with students. So it would be better next week. Okay. And what, what, what's really interesting, I just looked into the symbolic regression paper and they actually, you know, uh, work on the same problem to uh, find out how unknown functions could be found out or approximated in a parsimonious manner. Right. It's really it's interesting. nice paper. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like the fact that because they, 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 they connect a lot of things, including um, algorithmic AIT, algorithmic information theory and the minimum description length principle and so on. One of the comments I was, I didn't make earlier was that I'm really getting intrigued by the connection to computer science, you know, with all of this stuff. <laughs> That's what I also read. I'm halfway through this, um, why does deep and cheap learning work so well paper. Mm -hmm. That's also very, very useful. So I'm, I'm starting to connect the dots, I think. Yeah. I struggled my way through, you know, um, going through all these elementary operations and seeing what they do in, info, in terms of information. Yeah. And it was, it was worth doing all the footwork. Um, uh, yeah, we can talk about this next week or whenever you have okay. time. All right, sounds good. There, there are some, some nice, you know, very obvious patterns appearing, but now they have been encoded in my brain, these patterns. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, I'll take a look. I'll have more time to look at it before we talk. Mm -hmm. now. All right. Okay. Sounds good. You guys have a great good weekend. You too. Say hi to Mary. I will. Bye. Bye.